Hey, is the baby still in your belly? If it weren't for that baby, you'd be able to spend more on me. Rachel, the woman who shoved me and broke my water, even caused a scene at the obstetrician's office. I was terrified, but too scared to run away. Rachel's expression suddenly changed when she saw me, and she smiled broadly as she spoke. Christopher! But the name out of Rachel's mouth wasn't mine. It was unmistakably the name of my husband, Christopher, who was standing just behind me. Why don't you just dump her already? She's not even that pretty. Huh? I mean, she's not my wife. But Christopher said this to Rachel, who was arrogantly complaining. My name is Kimberly, I'm currently 26 years old. I've been married to my husband, Christopher, for just one year now. Born to loving parents, I spent my school years at a prestigious private girls' school. When I entered university, it was my first time attending a co-ed school, and I struggled to adjust to an environment with men. That's when Christopher, three years older than me, approached me. I had never interacted with older men before, but Christopher was very kind to me. He was the first man I ever opened my heart to. Eventually, I developed feelings for Christopher, and he accepted my feelings in return. A few years later, we got married. Now, we rent an apartment and enjoy our life together as a couple. On our first wedding anniversary, something wonderful happened to us. I found out I was pregnant. My period was late, so I took a pregnancy test with hopeful anticipation. Seeing the result, I cried tears of joy alone. And of course, I never doubted that Christopher would be just as happy. A few days later, I visited the obstetrician, and my pregnancy was confirmed. That evening, I shared the news with Christopher. Christopher, I need to talk to you. What? Why so formal? What's going on? Actually, I want you to open this. I handed Christopher a neatly wrapped box containing the ultrasound photo and maternity record, aiming to surprise him as I had seen on social media. Surprised, he took the box from me. What's this? A gift for our first anniversary? Well, just open it. I'm so happy. I didn't get you anything, though. Thank you. Christopher smiled as he placed his hands on the box. But as soon as he opened it and saw the contents, his expression darkened. What? What is this? He probably couldn't process it right away. Seeing this, I smiled and began to speak. Actually, I'm pregnant. I went to the hospital, and it's confirmed. I'm already 10 weeks along, and I got the maternity record, so I brought it with me right away. However, Christopher's face remained clouded even as he listened to my story. So, where's the present? What? Are you saying your pregnancy is the present? The moment I heard those words, my face froze. I thought he'd be happy, but maybe I had expected too much. I opened my mouth timidly. Um, aren't you happy? No, I'm happy. But, you got me all excited about a present, and then it's just this. You know I wanted a new wallet, right? It's true that Christopher had mentioned wanting a new wallet. Feeling guilty for leading him on, but also wishing to see more joy from him, I responded. About the wallet. Never mind. Whatever. He threw the box containing the maternity record and ultrasound photos across the room and left, clearly in a bad mood. I'm not hungry. I'm going to bed. I see, got it. Left alone in the living room, I carefully picked up the ultrasound photos and maternity record from the box. Even though I knew it was my fault, I was still a bit disappointed by Christopher's reaction. Some time after that pregnancy announcement, I bought Christopher a wallet as promised. It was an expensive one from a high-end brand. Christopher was very pleased with it. While I was happy about that, 
I carried a sense of dissatisfaction throughout my pregnancy. Despite this, the baby continued to grow healthily. However, during my seven-month pregnancy checkup, I was diagnosed with a threatened preterm labor and was suddenly hospitalized. I had felt some abdominal pain from time to time. I thought it was temporary, but my cervix had shortened more than I expected, and I was completely banned from any activities except for using the bathroom. When the hospitalization was decided, Christopher scolded me harshly. What were you thinking? If you felt something was wrong, you should have gone to the hospital right away. Still, I was honestly glad that Christopher started to seriously care about the baby. Although he was busy with work and couldn't visit me often, my mom took care of me during my hospital stay. It's hard not being able to move. I want to go home. When I occasionally voiced such weakness, your baby is struggling more, so stay strong. You're already a mom now, she would tell me. Her support was very reassuring. However, I felt lonely without Christopher. I must have been emotionally vulnerable. I understood that Christopher was busy with work. But even so, I wanted to see him even for a little bit. I would text him, but his replies were slow, and I spent my days looking at photos on my phone when mom wasn't around. One day, I made a new friend. Her name is Samantha Lopez, and she was also hospitalized for threatened preterm labor. Just like me, she wore the hospital pajamas and was pushed around in a wheelchair by a nurse whenever she needed to move for examinations. I had a feeling she was in the hospital for the same reasons, and one day, she asked for my contact information. We seem to be around the same age, and our bellies are about the same size. I thought it would be nice to talk. I was delighted and exchanged contact information with her. She was two years older than me, but like me, she was a first-time mother and was hospitalized for the same reason. Our due dates were roughly the same. We had a lot in common, and Samantha's presence was very reassuring. Samantha, too, spent her time mostly in bed, only getting up to go to the bathroom, so we started chatting on our phones. We played the same games and exchanged items, and she lent me some manga, which made my hospital stay much more enjoyable. Samantha and Kimberly are like real sisters. You even look alike. People would say, and we became that close. Since neither of us could move much, it was only natural that we grew close. One day, Christopher came to visit. It seemed he had a day off work and had been out drinking late the night before. Even though his visit was brief, I was very happy that he came. I made a friend. Her name is Samantha Lopez. I told Christopher about Samantha. Christopher tilted his head slightly. Lopez. And he muttered. What does her husband do for a living? Where do they live? I don't know what her husband does, but she said they live in an apartment near the station. We even talked about how our kids might go to the same public school district since it's close to our place. When he heard this, Christopher looked surprised. Then, with a bit of excitement, he said something surprising. She might be the wife of the executive vice president at my company. They live in an apartment near the station, and there's been talk about his wife being pregnant. Really? That could be possible. It's amazing that you might even work at the same place. I was genuinely surprised. So many coincidences seemed to be piling up that it felt like there was some special connection. However, it didn't seem like Christopher saw it that way, he had a sly smile on his face. Make sure you stay close to her. It'll definitely come in handy later. I froze at his words. Being friends with the VP's wife could be useful. If our kids become friends, it could open up connections and maybe even be a shortcut to a promotion. Wait, what are you saying? I'm glad you got hospitalized. Make sure to say hi to the VP's wife for me.
The happiness I felt from Christopher's visit crumbled in an instant. Even though our friendship was brief, Samantha and I supported each other as dear friends. We shared our hardships and anxieties, living each day praying for our baby's safety. Yet Christopher didn't understand or care about my situation or feelings and even said he was glad I was hospitalized. It was incredibly shocking and painful to hear him say such things. After that, Christopher visited a few more times, but all he ever cared about was whether I had gotten closer to Samantha. He never asked about the baby's condition. It was pathetic, even for my own husband. Eventually, the doctors determined that as long as I didn't overexert myself, I could likely carry the baby to term. I was discharged from the hospital and returned home. I'm so glad for you. Now all that's left is to wait for the baby to arrive safely. Samantha rejoiced in my discharge as if it were her own. Samantha, hang in there a little longer. Call me anytime, even in the middle of the night, if you need anything. Samantha, it seemed, would remain in the hospital until she gave birth. Although I was a bit worried about her, we promised to have healthy babies and parted ways for the time being. Returning home. I planned to stay off work until the baby was born and then take an extended leave. Though I was concerned about Samantha, I was relieved to be back home safely. However, a few days after returning home, just as I entered the final month of pregnancy, the doorbell rang in the evening delivery. It was a woman's voice. During my hospitalization, I hadn't been able to prepare for the baby's arrival, so I had ordered a lot of things like baby clothes and a heavy stroller as soon as I was discharged. Without suspecting anything, I opened the door. But the person standing there wasn't from the usual delivery company. It was a woman, standing there empty-handed. Huh? Um. That's when I realized something was off. I hadn't buzzed anyone in through the entrance, and it was odd that she had come straight to my door. Usually, the delivery person was a middle-aged man, there had never been a female delivery worker. As I began to feel suspicious, Are you Kimberly Wilson? The woman asked. Yes. Still thinking it might be a delivery, I instinctively responded when she said my name. In that instant, the woman shoved me with all her might. Ah! I screamed as I fell. I heard a popping sound at the same moment, but as I watched the woman who had pushed me run away, I panicked and shouted. Stop! When I tried to stand, I felt something warm and wet flowing from me. My water had broken. I realized it instantly. The sound I heard earlier was my water breaking. Fear gripped me as I felt the fluid continue to gush out with every move. Alone at home, I was terrified. Mom, help me. I realized I was holding my mobile phone and, crying, I called out for my mom. She came rushing over immediately, and we headed straight to the hospital. Even though I was at my last month of pregnancy, being only 36 weeks pregnant, I wasn't at full term yet. With my water breaking prematurely, I was overwhelmed with fear. By the time we arrived at the hospital, contractions had already started, leading straight to labor. Fortunately, the delivery itself went smoothly, and the baby was born crying healthily. However, because it wasn't full term, the baby was placed in an incubator to stay for a few days. I wished I could have kept the baby inside for a few more days. Worried about any possible complications, I wept. There's nothing we can do about it, it's no one's fault, my mom reassured me. That's right. Plus, the baby was born healthy, so don't blame yourself too much. Added my dad, who had also rushed to the hospital. Their kindness made me cry even more. In the midst of the confusion, I had only mentioned that my water broke, but I now explained that I was pushed by an intruder. My parents' faces turned pale. What did you say? Did you recognize the person? 
both of them were furious at the intruder. However, I had no idea who the person was. Even if I filed a police report, there was a chance the perpetrator might not be found. Still, the thought of staying in that house terrified me, so I planned to go to the police as soon as I was discharged. A while later, Christopher managed to wrap up his work and rushed to the hospital. He was relieved that the baby was born safely but turned pale upon hearing about the intruder. Did you recognize the person? Maybe someone who holds a grudge against you? I don't remember anything like that, and I've never seen that person before. I racked my brain but couldn't recall anyone who might fit the description of the intruder. However, the fact that the intruder knew my name and where I lived indicated they held a grudge against me. Christopher's suggestion that someone might hold a grudge seemed plausible, but I couldn't figure out who it could be. If only I knew who the person was, I might remember something. In any case, I'll go to the police once I'm discharged. Yeah, that's a good idea. The important thing is that you're safe. Get some rest. Christopher said that to me. Those words gave me peace of mind. All I could do now was pray for our baby's health. But then, two days later, another incident occurred. There was a commotion outside the room. What's going on? Curious, I peeked outside and saw a group of people. In the middle of them was Samantha. It's Samantha. Samantha still had a large belly. She must have been transferred from the gynecology ward to the obstetrics ward as her delivery approached. Feeling happy, I was about to call out to her, but she seemed to be in the middle of something serious. The woman next to Samantha was loudly yelling at her. A few people had gathered from other rooms to watch the scene unfold. I don't understand what you're saying, Samantha said. Stop pretending. You're Kimberly, right? The woman shouted. Her voice was loud enough to be heard in my room, prompting Christopher to come out and ask. What's going on? But I couldn't answer his question. The sight of the woman with Samantha made my blood run cold, and her words left me paralyzed. She was the same woman who had pushed me. From the way she was calling Samantha Kimberly, it was clear she was looking for me. But my lips trembled, and I couldn't form words. Wait, Kimberly? Kimberly Wilson? Are you a friend of Kimberly? Samantha asked the woman. Don't try to fool me. The woman replied, seemingly oblivious to Samantha's question. And is the baby still in your belly? If you didn't have that baby, he'd spend more on me, the woman continued. Huh? Samantha responded, confused. At that moment, the woman noticed me. I was too scared to move, but she didn't pay me any mind. Instead, she smiled broadly and called out. Christopher. It was unmistakably my husband's name. The woman seemed to think I was just one of the people gathered around. Ignoring me, she ran to Christopher, complaining about Samantha. That woman has such a bad attitude. She said, pointing at Samantha. What? Christopher asked, baffled. I didn't expect the baby not to be born yet. I pushed her, and she fell. How is she okay? If the baby were gone, you'd buy me more presents, the woman continued. I was horrified by their conversation. There was no doubt. This woman had mistaken Samantha for me and had tried to endanger my baby, hoping it would be gone. Samantha, though glancing at me, didn't speak and instead looked at us with a surprised expression. Anyway, you should just dump that woman. She's not even that pretty. The woman said, pointing at Samantha and mocking her. Samantha's face twisted in displeasure, clearly offended. The attention of the onlookers made Christopher anxious. Uh, she's not my wife. Christopher said to the woman. What? The woman's face contorted with annoyance at Christopher's words. 
Then, where is your wife? Does that mean that woman was telling the truth? She demanded. I've been telling you, it's not me. Samantha said, frowning and stepping closer to us. Seeing my near tears, she raised her voice. Anyway, what are you talking about? She asked. The woman, however, remained unfazed. Sorry, it really wasn't you, she said nonchalantly. So, you're Kimberly's husband, right? Samantha asked Christopher. Although I had told Christopher about Samantha, the two had never met, so he was surprised she knew who he was. Uh, are you a friend of Kimberly? Christopher asked. That's not important right now. What matters is, what did you mean by she pushed Kimberly? Who is this woman? Samantha said rapidly, demanding answers from the two. Christopher and the woman exchanged glances. I'm sorry for dragging you into this. This is our issue. Christopher apologized to Samantha. However, Samantha remained stern. It may be your issue, but I want to know what happened to Kimberly. Did you really push her? Who are you? She insisted, voicing my own thoughts. The woman replied, I'm Rachel, Christopher's girlfriend. I didn't push her, I just gave her a little shove, and she fell. It was more like an accident. Hey! Christopher hurried to cover her mouth, but it was too late. I had heard everything. When I had told Christopher about the assault, he had speculated that someone must have had a grudge against me. It turned out it was all because of him. The sadness and anger made my fists clench. Christopher merely showed concern without saying a word. Probably because Rachel was there. Just then. What's all this commotion? Another person joined our conversation. Christopher and Rachel turned pale as they saw who it was. Why is the executive director here? They both muttered in shock. Ah, uh, could it be that you are? Christopher asked Samantha fearfully. I'm Samantha Lopez. My husband works with you. Samantha said, introducing herself to Christopher. Both Christopher and Rachel were left speechless, trembling in fear. Christopher, Samantha mentioned that you've gotten close to Kimberly. And Rachel, you work part-time at the company, correct? What are you doing here? Oh, uh. Christopher replied awkwardly. Rachel, looking uncomfortable, bowed her head slightly. It seemed Rachel was indeed working part-time at Christopher's company. Listening to their conversation, I stepped forward and spoke up. I'm Kimberly Wilson. Nice to meet you. Rachel finally turned her gaze to me, looking surprised. Meanwhile, Daniel spoke again. Oh, so you're Kimberly. Samantha has mentioned you. You've already given birth? Yes, it was quite a difficult time, I replied. Rachel fell silent at my words. She had been acting so high and mighty just a moment ago, but as soon as her boss showed up, she couldn't say anything. How pathetic. I'd like to understand the situation here. It was Samantha who answered Daniel. She's Kimberly's husband's girlfriend. Girlfriend? Daniel's eyebrows knitted together in a frown. Christopher and Rachel tried to force smiles, but no one was fooled. I see that Rachel here also works at the same company as you. She pushed me, which caused my water to break prematurely. I was planning to report it to the police, so I'm glad I know her identity now. Rachel turned pale at my words, looking at me. But I refused to meet her gaze. I didn't want to see her face. Taking advantage of my silence, Rachel tried to slip away. Well, I'll be going then. Christopher, I'll contact you later. Wait! Samantha blocked Rachel's path not wanting her to escape. I turned my gaze to Rachel. Before you go, can you give me your name and address? I asked, finally meeting her eyes. 
This time, Rachel couldn't maintain eye contact and looked down. At that moment, the commotion had caught the attention of others, and a nurse had informed the hospital director. What's going on here? The director asked, arriving on the scene. Uh, nothing. Sorry for the disturbance. Christopher tried to calm the situation, but the hospital director's face remained stern and angry. I had seen her many times during prenatal checkups and my hospital stay, always greeting me with a warm smile. She was usually a kind and wonderful woman, but seeing her this furious was a shock not just to me, but probably to everyone present. Mr. Wilson, your wife was pushed, causing her water to break. Why are you reacting this way? According to reports, she was pushed by Rachel. The director's anger was directed at Christopher, who looked increasingly nervous. Rachel, reacting to these words, said, What? The culprit? That makes it sound like it's my fault. I didn't cause her water to break. She began to panic. She hadn't expected to be reported. It was clear she wanted to downplay her actions. However, the director responded. Kimberly had a high-risk pregnancy and had just been discharged. A sudden shock could very well have caused her water to break. That is. Pushing a pregnant woman, what were you thinking? It wasn't just the director. The nurse and everyone around were glaring at Rachel. Of course they would. In this place, there were women who had just given birth or were about to give birth, along with their families. Everyone was carrying precious lives within them. Rachel's actions were unforgivable in any context, but here, they were even more intolerable. Rachel was unable to escape or retort. Head nurse, call the police. With that single command, Rachel finally raised her head and began to apologize. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You're apologizing to the wrong person. But the director's sharp words made her crouch at my feet. I'm sorry, please forgive me. And she started to cry. Seeing this, Christopher put his hand on my shoulder. Rachel is apologizing, and I'm sorry too. Let's not blow this up by calling the police right away. Let's talk first. I felt a surge of anger. How could he say such a thing? There was no way I could forgive this. And it seemed I wasn't the only one who felt this way. Christopher, what are you saying? That's right, that's terrible. Samantha and Daniel stood up for me. Christopher, unable to defy Daniel, muttered, Uh, and shrank back. Then, the police arrived shortly after. Rachel, still crying, was taken away. Amidst a chorus of jeers from everyone present. Apart from Samantha, I didn't know anyone there, but their support made me feel incredibly strong. A few days later, Samantha also gave birth safely and we both were able to leave the hospital without any complications. Our babies were healthy and full of life. I went back to my parents' home, with no intention of returning to my house. Since I wouldn't be able to move around much for a while, I planned to devote all my energy to my first experience with child-rearing and the divorce proceedings, with my parents' support. During this time, I received a call from Samantha, Daniel is furious with Christopher and Rachel. Samantha said, trying to be considerate. Of course, Rachel caused such an incident, so she's going to be fired, but Daniel also said he would do whatever he could regarding Christopher. I was deeply grateful for Samantha and Daniel's kindness. I was determined to go through with the divorce, and I would likely need their help in the future. Christopher visited our home a few times. I want to see Kimberly. Please, let me talk to her. He would shout from the front door, only to be turned away by my dad. You'll see her during the divorce proceedings. Right now, she's busy with the baby and has no time to see you. 
my dad would relay my message. Christopher seemed unsatisfied but had no choice but to leave only to come back again. Watching my dad send him away repeatedly was pathetic and I couldn't help but laugh. In the midst of this, I received the investigation results from the detective I had hired. I had asked my mom to handle the arrangements right after I was discharged. Because I wanted to know the truth about Christopher and Rachel's relationship. Given the recent events, I didn't expect solid evidence, but I was able to obtain more than enough proof. Even after I moved back to my parents' home, Christopher continued seeing Rachel. There were photos of them at a hotel and of Christopher entering Rachel's apartment, where she lived alone, all within just a few days. The next day, Christopher, unaware of what I knew, came to our house again. Come in. My dad invited him inside, which was unusual since he was usually turned away at the door. Christopher entered the living room with a smile. I didn't want him to see the baby, so my mom was taking care of the child in another room. Kimberly, you've finally forgiven me. He said, entering the living room with a relaxed smile. His smile irritated me. What are you talking about? I'm here to get you to sign the divorce papers. What? No way. I could never forgive you. Christopher froze. He had genuinely thought I had forgiven him, and the contrast in his expectations left him visibly deflated. Please, I'll do better from now on. Can't you forgive me this once? Christopher pleaded tearfully, hoping for reconciliation. If you regret it so much, why did you cheat? I replied, tears streaming down my face, but I couldn't bring myself to forgive him. Our conversation dragged on for over an hour without any progress. Finally, I handed over the documents from the detective. I know you're still seeing Rachel. I'll be hiring a lawyer to demand compensation in the divorce proceedings. If you feel any remorse, reflect on your actions." Christopher turned pale upon seeing the investigation report. I felt no sympathy for him anymore. If you truly regret it, divorce Kimberly, my dad urged. Reluctantly, Christopher signed the divorce papers realizing he had no other option. I just heard from Samantha. Daniel said he'd help however he can, I mentioned. What? Christopher looked bewildered. I plan to have your child support payments deducted directly from your salary, so you don't forget to pay. You're okay with that, right? Christopher, visibly shaken, nodded reluctantly. You've probably spent all your savings on Rachel, so I'll allow you to pay the compensation in installments." That completely silenced him. With Daniel keeping an eye on things, I was confident I wouldn't miss out on the money. I smirked at Christopher's dejected demeanor. I thought this was the end of it, but there was still something I needed to do. I contacted a number from the detective's report. Two days later, Kimberly, I know you're there. What are you thinking? Rachel showed up at my doorstep. She screamed, banging on the door furiously. Since I was exhausted from childbirth, I had agreed to settle out of court, but now I wondered what she wanted. Surprised, my dad told me to stay inside while he answered the door. What do you want? He asked. It's all Kimberly's fault. Rachel collapsed in the doorway, crying and crouching in despair. Watching from a distance, I couldn't help but smile. Did your fiancé dump you? I asked. Rachel lifted her head abruptly. The detective's report had revealed another fact. Rachel had a fiancé, an affluent man's son and a graduate of a prestigious university. It infuriated me that she had pursued Christopher despite having such an impressive fiancé. However, I hadn't informed Rachel's fiancé out of nowhere. But I had a reason to talk to him. Can you blame me? 
I didn't want our kids to be half-siblings. Since there's a chance the baby you're carrying could be Christopher's, I couldn't stay silent, I said. Rachel started sobbing even harder. Yes, she was currently pregnant. However, she didn't know if the baby's father was her fiancé or Christopher. She planned to marry her fiancé without disclosing this. Your fiancé is a wonderful person. He apologized on your behalf and said he was glad he wouldn't have to raise another man's child. The baby is his! Rachel insisted. Even so, he said he was grateful to learn about your betrayal before the wedding. Anyone would break up with their girlfriend if they found out she had been cheating with a married man and had assaulted his wife. Her fiancé had simply done what was normal. Rachel cried and wailed as if she were the victim, and I couldn't help but worry if she was fit to be a mother with such selfish thinking. According to the report, Rachel was past the point where she could legally get an abortion. She would likely raise the child with Christopher. Though, given her reaction, it seemed her fiancé was her true love. She had used Christopher, spending his money and treating him as a convenient distraction. Christopher lost his family because of Rachel, and she lost her true love because of Christopher. Both were getting what they deserved. Later, Rachel did give birth. DNA testing confirmed the baby was her fiancé's. I was relieved that my child wouldn't have a half-sibling and felt sympathy for Rachel's ex-fiancé. However, he turned out to be more responsible than I had imagined. Let's get back together and raise our child. Rachel had brazenly suggested, but he firmly refused. He fought for and won custody of the child in court. Given Rachel's unemployment, history of violence, even if settled out of court, and lack of savings due to paying me off, she was deemed unfit to raise the child. Although mothers typically have an advantage in custody battles, this verdict was just. The child is innocent and undoubtedly mine. I'll do my best to raise them with my parents' help. He told me. I was confident his child would grow up well. Rachel, on the other hand, was devastated by losing custody. She returned to her parents' home and became a recluse. Having lost her fiancé, child, and job due to her own poor decisions, she deeply regretted her actions. Her parents, seemingly decent people, apologized to me. I don't wish happiness for Rachel, but please support her. I told them. I had no further feelings for her. Naturally, Christopher and Rachel broke up. Under Daniel's supervision, Christopher worked diligently to pay child support and compensation. Quitting wasn't an option. His affair with Rachel and subsequent abandonment by both her and me became the subject of workplace gossip, making things awkward for him. No matter how difficult things got for him, it wouldn't compare to my suffering. He risked his child's and wife's lives, and I hoped he'd spend his life making amends. Afterward, I continued living with my parents and raising my son with their help. He was born a bit early but was growing well and brought me immense joy. I planned to return to work once a childcare center was arranged. Samantha and I remained close. Our bond stronger after overcoming tough times together. She became like a sister to me, and our friendship was invaluable. Being a single mother would be challenging, but I was determined to persevere. After all, I had many people on my side. When I get back, you promise to leave. And the end of this month is just around the corner. As a final task, why don't you sign the divorce papers? Next to Matt stood a woman with a child. The woman was holding hands with a child who looked to be around kindergarten age. Let me introduce my wife, Kristen. Kristen was still young and quite a sexy woman. As I said before, you and I are practically strangers now. You two no longer have the right to live in this house. As Matt said this, an eerie smile appeared on his face. Sign the divorce papers and you and our son can get out. 
Matt's gaze looked down on me and our son Noah with a victorious glint in his eyes. He seemed to believe everything was going according to his plan, but upon learning a certain truth, he suddenly fell to his knees. How could you do this? I thought you were just a clueless housewife. As he muttered this, Noah said in exasperation. What? Dad, you didn't know? When he showed him a book, Matt became half crazed. My name is Layla. I'm a 42-year-old. A working mother. I have a 16-year-old son named Noah with my husband Matt, who works for a trading company. Matt's job keeps him busy both domestically and abroad, so I've pretty much raised Noah on my own. He's currently on a solo work assignment, so we're essentially living separately. Our main communication is through video calls and messages. Even though it's within the country, it's too far for a day trip. Matt only comes home around Christmas and Thanksgiving. Even then, he has to visit his parents who live about an hour away, so the three of us rarely get to spend much time together as a family. My relationship with Matt is neither particularly good nor bad. I suppose this is normal for a married couple who's been together for over a decade. There's familial love, but the romantic feelings have faded. He works for a major trading company, so we've never struggled financially. Since he is often away, I tried to stay home full-time when Noah was little. Matt agreed this so that Noah wouldn't feel lonely. But when Noah reached the upper grades of elementary school and Matt started his solo assignment, Noah seemed to start finding my presence annoying. My brother was the same way, so maybe it's just a phase at that age where they get irritated with their mothers. That's when I started thinking about getting a job. It's fine if you want to work, but I don't want people thinking I can't provide for my family. That was the first thing he said when I brought up wanting to work. For example, choose a job that uses your hobbies or helps you improve your skills. I thought any job would be fine as long as it suited me, but considering Matt's opinion, I decided to become an assistant at a flower arranging classroom. Many of the people Matt works with are foreigners, so I figured my experience studying flower arrangement at florists and design schools would come in handy. Sounds good. It'll probably be useful if I get transferred overseas too. Since he agreed, I've been working part-time at that job ever since. Although we don't have financial worries, I wanted to have a serious talk with Matt about Noah's future. You're right. I've been thinking we need to discuss the future too. I was relieved by Matt's response. Noah is a high school freshman and will be starting his sophomore year in the fall. It's about time to seriously think about his future path. There's talk of me returning to the head office in the fall. The timing would be good with the new school term. However, the talk about the future Matt brought up when he came home for the long weekend was something I never could have imagined. I want a divorce. Matt suddenly brought this up without any explanation. We've been separated for a long time now, so I think that's sufficient grounds for divorce. If we do it now, you and I can both still start new lives. Wait a minute. This is too sudden. Talk about being blindsided. I hastily interrupted Matt. We're only separated because you're on a solo work assignment. I never intended for us to actually be separated. But you didn't come with me, did you? That's because of Noah's schooling and your dad too. My father-in-law Orlando is doing well, living alone in a retirement community. This house originally belonged to Matt's parents, but when we got married, they moved out to that condominium. Matt and Orlando don't get along very well. When my mother-in-law Maria was still alive, Matt at least kept in touch with them, but after Maria passed away, he completely cut off contact. I told you to just leave that man alone. He's in a proper facility, so there's no need for us to take care of him. Even if you say that, I can't just ignore him. There wasn't any major reason why Matt and Orlando's relationship soured. It was a buildup of little things over many years. Even with parents and children, sometimes personalities just clash. Both Orlando and Maria were wonderful people. That's why I maintained a close relationship with both of them, and stayed in touch with Orlando even after he was alone. I also visit the condominium from time to time. That's something you did on your own, isn't it? I never asked you to do that. He was right, but it's not something I can just dismiss so easily. It's the same with Noah's school. If you really wanted to, you could have transferred him. Weren't you the one who said you wanted him to go to that school? Noah enrolled in a school that goes straight through to university. 
Sure, I wanted that too, but if you really wanted to, you could have transferred him, right? That may be true, but we can't just do something like that. So that's how it is. You chose not to live with me. Anyway, I need you to sign this. Saying that, Matt handed me a filled out form. I'm back now, but I doubt you'd want to stay with me in this situation. I'll go stay at a hotel or something. Leaving those words behind, Matt walked out of the house. I was left standing there, dumbfounded. Why are you sitting in the dark? Wait, where's dad? Noah had gone to see a movie with a friend that day. By the time he got home, the late summer sun had completely set. It was around mid-afternoon when Matt had come home and left. Apparently, I had been sitting like that for several hours. What's this? Noah picked up the divorce papers that had been left on the living room table. What should I do? How can I possibly explain this? My own thoughts aren't even sorted out yet, and I have no idea what to say to Noah or how to say it. Seeing me frozen, Noah let out a sigh, put down the divorce papers, and left the room. Oh no, not only Matt, but my son is going to abandon me too. Lost in that thought, I was startled when Noah quickly came back. Here, eat. You can't think straight on an empty stomach. Eat well, sleep well, and then we'll think about what to do next. Saying that, Noah held out a plate with two large sandwiches on it. He must have made them with great care. Realizing that, I couldn't stop the tears from spilling out. Come on, just hurry up and eat. Pretending not to see my tears, he said that, and I ate the sandwiches while crying. The simple ham and cheese sandwiches tasted better than any fancy meal I'd ever had. After returning to his solo assignment location, Matt sent me several messages. The gist of them was, I want to get divorced by next spring. I'll properly pay child support for Noah until he's an adult. The current age of majority is 18, but since he'll turn 18 while still in high school, I'll go the extra mile and support him until he graduates. I was appalled by the string of high and mighty words, as if he was doing me a huge favor by paying. Noah isn't just my child, he's the child of both me and Matt. How can he be so full of himself while only fulfilling the bare minimum of his obligations? My solo assignment period ends in the spring, so I'll move back into that house when I return. Make sure you're ready to move out by then. You should be able to find a decent place in half a year. I'm not completely heartless, so I'll cover your moving expenses. Since he's telling me to leave the home I've lived in for years, of course I'd expect him to pay if I actually did need to move. But I just can't see any necessity for that. Why do I absolutely have to leave this house? The reason for the divorce is the natural breakdown of our marital relationship, so I won't pay any compensation in a divorce trial. However, in recognition of your years of hard work as a housewife handling the housework and child rearing, I'm willing to provide some financial assistance. Of course, I won't demand any compensation from you in the divorce either. Of course, I don't feel there's any need for me to pay compensation in a divorce trial. It's not like I've been living a life of leisure. It's true that we've been living apart, but whenever Matt couldn't make it back here, I would visit his assignment location with Noah, and we interacted like a normal family during those times. I can't accept natural breakdown as a reason at all. If you don't think you can make a living with your current job, I'm willing to help you find a new one. But in that case, you'd need to leave the town you're living in now. I'm sure you wouldn't enjoy having to see me either. There's no way I could support myself with just my part-time job as a flower arrangement assistant. But even if he tells me to leave this town and find work somewhere else, I absolutely cannot accept such a demand. Why should I have to do something like that? I'll give you custody of Noah. He's been living with you for years, so he'd probably be more comfortable that way. Besides, he's almost 18 already, so he won't need to rely on his parents forever. If Noah ever needs me, I'm willing to offer advice and such, but I won't demand visitation or anything like that. Of course, if we do end up getting divorced, I plan to take custody of him. But from the way this is written, it seems like Matt is trying to abandon even his own son. How can he be so heartless? I can't imagine how hurt Noah would be if he knew about this. I let out a sigh after reading through everything. Not a single reason is acceptable. How self-centered can he be? When he first told me he wanted a divorce, I was shocked and devastated, 
but dealing with someone so egotistical, I'm starting to think good riddance. I went to Matt's assignment location to talk with him. It was during his work hours, but I have a spare key to the condominium. When I entered, the room was clean and tidy as always. It felt devoid of any sign of life. He's always been a neat freak, but it really looks like a model room. As I waited in the room, night fell and Matt came home. You're here? If you're going to come, at least let me know beforehand. Matt said that in an irritated tone. Did you bring the signed divorce papers today? I'm ready to go, so you can just file them yourself. Without so much as glancing at me, he took off his suit jacket and loosened his tie. He carefully hung each item on a hanger and pulled to smooth out the wrinkles. He was always like this. I remember when we used to live together. Everything was precise and flawless about him. I thought maybe you had a woman here and this was a surprise inspection. If so, too bad for you. Indeed, there was no sign of anything like that at all. What about dinner? I already ate. This is pretty much how it always is. I can't even remember the last time I enjoyed a home-cooked meal. Saying that sarcastically, Matt took a cold beer from the fridge, sat at the table, and started drinking. You get it now, don't you? Why I said I want a divorce. I'm tired of living like this for years. Then you should have just told me you wanted me to come. With Noah there, and you starting a part-time job, you have your own life rhythm. I couldn't ask you to throw that all away and come here. Matt said, taking another sip of his beer. Living like this, one day it suddenly hit me. Maybe I don't need a family after all. He seemed adamant that the reason for the divorce was the separated lifestyle of his solo assignment. Then could you at least wait until Noah graduates high school? It's only two more years, no, a year and a half, isn't it? No can do. I want the divorce finalized by next spring. What's happening next spring? Matt reacted slightly to these words I blurted out without thinking. I told you. I'm being transferred back to headquarters. I thought it was a good opportunity. Can't we spend at least this last year living as a family, for just that short remaining time? No, it has to be by next spring. The discussion went nowhere, with Matt insisting no matter what that he wanted the divorce by next spring. Unable to do anything about it, I left Matt's room stayed at a hotel that night, and decided to go home the next day. I couldn't bear the thought of waiting in that room to spend time alone with Matt. I never visited Matt again after that. I knew it would be pointless. Important matters were handled through recorded messages, and various things started moving towards the spring. First was discussing the unacceptable parts of Matt's proposal. I wanted him to pay for Noah's education until he graduated university. If that was unacceptable, I wouldn't sign the divorce papers. When I sent that, I got an angry phone call. I said until he turns 18 and becomes an adult. If you don't like that, then I won't pay a penny of Noah's child support after the divorce. That's impossible. We're still married until the divorce papers are filed. And you're obligated to pay child support until Noah turns 18. After going back and forth about it several times, Matt finally gave in. Fine, I'll pay for Noah's education until he graduates university, but only for four years. If he has to repeat a year or anything, I'm not paying a cent beyond that. Understood, please cover the four years then. And put that in a notarized document. You're saying you don't trust me? Of course I don't. How could I possibly trust him? He's the kind of man who would suddenly demand a divorce for a reason like that. If I don't get it properly documented, who knows when he might change his mind. If you won't agree to that, then we'll go to divorce mediation. And if that doesn't settle it, we'll go to trial. When I said that, he put it in a notarized document. In exchange, I'm not paying any compensation in the divorce trial. Yes, that's fine. Of course, I won't pay either. Got it. Now hurry up and file the divorce papers. Every time he said that, I pointed out unacceptable conditions of the divorce. Let's talk about division of assets. I expect that to be handled properly as well. I supported you while you were unemployed, and you still want to take more? You weren't supporting me, I was raising your child. If you're going to call me an unemployed parasite, then we can settle it in mediation or court. 
When I said that, Matt looked displeased but agreed to the asset division, and of course I had him put that in a notarized document too. Matt had a high salary, so it amounted to quite a sum. You've taken plenty now, so just file the divorce papers already. Oh, I thought next spring was fine. Something else might still come up, so please wait. If you think dragging it out like that will make me retract the divorce, you're sorely mistaken. As spring approached, Matt became increasingly unable to hide his irritation. Why are you getting so irritated? It shouldn't be a problem if it's a little delayed. It's a huge problem. Is there some reason you're in such a rush? If there is and you tell me, I might consider it. Even when I offered a compromise, he said there was no such reason. In that case, I don't see any problem with refusing to agree to the divorce until I'm satisfied. In any case, I'm the one with the upper hand now. I intend to let this play out until I'm content. In parallel with stalling on signing the divorce papers, I was working on several things, and the months flew by. When on earth are you going to file the divorce papers? The new year has already begun! Matt, who hadn't come home for Christmas, impatiently demanded. That's true, it's already the new year. But there are still three months until spring. And I don't think it's a problem if it goes a little past that. That's why I'm telling you to file them by March. I want to be divorced by the time I return to headquarters. It's hard for me to make up my mind so quickly, and I have a lot to take care of. I dodged Matt's demands with a vague attitude. So, you've already decided on a place to live, right? Don't worry, that's all settled. That's good. I'll be leaving for work from this house starting next year. Matt let out a genuinely relieved sigh at my words. Be careful on your way back. Even so, you and Noah are leaving the house so I can move in. Remember, I'm not coming back to live with you too. I know that without being told. I have no intention of accepting this man as family anymore either. Then, in the final week of March, he came back home. All the arrangements were finished, but I still hadn't filed the divorce papers. When I get back, you promise to leave. And the end of this month is just around the corner. As a final task, why don't you sign the divorce papers? Next to Matt stood a woman with a child. The woman was holding hands with a child who looked to be around kindergarten age. Let me introduce you. This is my wife, Kristen. Kristen was still young and quite a flashy woman. Nice to meet you. Is that your son? Looking somewhat guilty, Kristen gently hid the child behind her. What's your name, dear? Hey, stop that. It's none of your business. Matt also told me off, as if shielding the child. As I said before, you and I are practically strangers now. You two no longer have the right to live in this house. As Matt said this, an eerie smile appeared on his face. Sign the divorce papers and you and Noah can get out. His gaze looked down on me and Noah with a victorious glint. So that's what this was all about. What of it? All the arrangements should be settled. All that's left is filing the divorce papers and being done with it. We agreed not to seek any compensation in the divorce trial. I'm relieved to hear that. I heard you received quite a bit from Matt, so I don't need to feel guilty about this anymore. The last part seemed to be directed at him. Yeah, that's right. I really wanted to get properly married by today, but I'm truly sorry about that part. But I'm glad we'll make it in time for Zachary's school enrollment. Yes, the reason Matt rushed the divorce. It was so he could enroll the child he had with Kristen in time to start elementary school. As a parent, I can understand wanting your child to start school with a proper family. But that's a separate matter from this. I told Matt and Kristen. About the compensation in the divorce trial, I will be seeking it. But the notarized document clearly states we agreed not to pay any compensation in the divorce trial. Yes, for the divorce. I held up the notarized document I had prepared. We won't pay each other any compensation for the divorce itself, but I will be seeking compensation for your relationship with that woman and child. Of course, from that woman too. That's ridiculous. I won't pay a single dollar for something like that. Matt shouted in agitation. The child called Zachary got scared and clung to Kristen. It's not ridiculous at all. Claims for infidelity can be made within three years of the day the fact became known. 
That's clearly established. Compensation for divorce and compensation for infidelity are separate matters. But your stated reason for divorce, the long separation due to your solo work assignment, turned out to be a lie. So it seems I can seek compensation for the divorce itself too. What did you say? The real reason for the divorce is those two. You want to leave me and remarry that woman and acknowledge the child, right? If that was the reason, of course I would have demanded compensation in the divorce trial. It's properly determined by law. If a divorce is obtained through deception or threats, the divorce itself can be annulled. A person who entered into marriage due to fraud or duress may request the family court to annul the marriage. I showed them the documents I had. The divorce isn't finalized yet, but I think the contents of that notarized document can be amended too. His hand holding the documents was trembling. So let's have a proper discussion about the divorce compensation again, shall we? I told him with a beaming smile. Then the agreement about Noah's education is void too. That's not possible. There's no valid reason to annul it. It's the same notarized document. He insisted desperately, but that argument doesn't hold. It's the same document but the contents are different. If I had lied, then you might be able to make that claim, but there are no lies on my part. This is the fact and truth. I wanted Matt to fulfill his obligations as Noah's parent, and Matt agreed to that. There are no lies there. So I don't think your claim will go through. Enough, I get it. I'll pay if that's what it takes. Thank you. I smiled from ear to ear. As brightly as possible to make it maximally frustrating for Matt. You greedy woman. Matt spat out those words. But as long as I pay up, that's all that matters. Now hand over the divorce papers. Yes, that's fine. In fact, I already submitted them this morning. Here's the proof of receipt. I handed Matt the proof of receipt for the divorce papers. With this, it's a done deal. Matt showed it to Kristen too, and they nodded at each other, looking satisfied. Then we're finished talking. You have no reason to be here anymore, so hurry up and leave. About that, Noah and I have the right to live here. You two are the ones who need to leave. Don't be ridiculous, this is my house. Poor him has no idea. I'll have to properly educate him. Whose name is this house under? It's dad's, of course. What's dad's is mine. Wrong, it's under my name. Hearing that, he looked surprised for a moment, but then laughed and said, You don't actually think it's yours just because you have the right of residence, do you? I wouldn't make such a stupid mistake. Once you divorce me, you won't have any ties to dad anymore. In other words, you'll lose the right to live in this house. Sighing, I held out another set of documents. What the? Matt's eyes widened as he looked at the papers. I became his adopted daughter. And he decided to bequeath this house to me. The documents I showed Matt clearly stated that I was his adopted child. That's ridiculous. See, it's true. He did this because I always looked out for him. After Matt brought up divorce, I consulted with Orlando. My own parents are already gone. They both passed away one after the other when we had just gotten married. Orlando and Maria cherished me like their own daughter. That's why I took good care of my parents-in-law, much more than their actual son Matt did. He told me to investigate properly and had a detective look into it. As a result, we found out Matt had a mistress and a secret child. You requested the solo assignment so you could live with the woman you were already involved with, didn't you? Kristen worked at a nightclub where she met Matt. She was only 20 at the time, but quickly got close to Matt and they became intimate. Then she got pregnant. Matt thought it over and decided to lead a double life so he could live with Kristen and the child. I visited your assignment location several times but never saw any sign of a woman. Now I know why. He had two residences at his post. One was a sweet home to live in with them. The other was camouflaged to deceive us when we visited, so we wouldn't realize there was a woman. After Matt's solo assignment started, Noah and I went to see him many times. I was always impressed by how clean the place was, but of course, it's practically the same as not living there at all. Matt had deliberately installed cameras in that house to get notified if someone entered the room. When Orlando found out, he was furious at how underhanded it was. 
He said he wouldn't leave you anything and it would all go to Noah. That's when he proposed adopting me. No way! Matt probably thought everything was going according to his plan, but upon learning the truth, he crumpled to the floor. Do you know what disinheritance is? He is going through that process now. What's that? Simply put, it means removing you as his heir. Once the family court makes its judgment, you'll formally no longer be an heir, and the inheritance will go to Noah through representation. When the decedent leaving assets wants to exclude an heir with rights from the inheritance for some reason, there's a way. In this case, he decided to do so because Matt was practically estranged from his dad, and because of his terrible treatment of his wife and child. After the asset-holding decedent passes away, the presumptive heirs who are presumed to become heirs have a right to a statutory share, a minimum guaranteed inheritance. Disinheritance is the final method used when you don't want to give even that minimum share. Orlando said he would do this due to his long-standing conflict with Matt, his gratitude towards me, his son's wife who stood by him instead, and as an apology for Matt's actions. When Matt loses his qualification as an heir, his grandson Noah will be recognized as the heir through inheritance by representation, skipping over him. However, if Matt is dissatisfied with that decision, it would lead to a court battle. In case that happened, he adopted me for now and gave me this house as a gift before his death. So, Orlando and I discussed it and decided to do this. How could you do this? I thought you were just a clueless housewife who didn't know anything. As Matt muttered that, Noah said in exasperation. What? Dad, you didn't know? Noah handed Matt a book. Mrs. Rose's Brilliant Deductions? What is this book? I know it, it's a huge hit right now. I heard it's being made into a movie soon. I'm reading it too, I love it. Mom wrote that book. She studied a lot of things to write it, so she's become quite knowledgeable about the law and such. His words left the two of them frozen. I certainly was a housewife with no real-world experience, just as he thought. But I loved writing, and had been secretly posting novels online without telling him. Then I wrote a series set at the flower arrangement classroom where I worked part-time, about the classroom assistant, a housewife nicknamed Mrs. Rose, solving difficult cases one after another. It became a huge hit. I never heard about that. When the movie deal came up, I thought I should finally confess to you soon. But then you brought up divorce first. Too bad, huh? Then the royalties from that book are marital property. Right? How much will you get from the movie deal? We need to properly divide that in the asset split too, don't we? Unfortunately, the divorce is finalized. The royalties and movie profits have nothing to do with you anymore. Hearing my words, Matt let out a loud wail and just kept repeating. That's a lie! Over and over. You're unbelievable. The moment you realize I have value, after years of belittling me, deceiving me, and trying to kick me out? If you have any arguments, please take them up with my lawyer from now on. Now, hurry up and get out. With that, I promptly kicked Matt, Kristen, and the others out of the house. I felt bad for little Zachary, but there was nothing I could do for him. Matt sent numerous requests for reconciliation, but of course I wouldn't accept something like that. More importantly, make sure you properly acknowledge Zachary. He's starting elementary school soon, right? It's sad to leave things as they are. Kristen also pressured him to acknowledge him, and it seems they got married and properly became parent and child. It's only natural to take responsibility for your own child. After the elementary school entrance ceremony was over and their life settled down, I waited a bit and then sent a content certified mail demanding compensation in the divorce trial. After all, it was years of infidelity and a double life to enable it. The amount was quite substantial. You're making a lot of money now, aren't you? Then cut me some slack on the divorce compensation, let bygones be bygones. He made such a ridiculous request, but of course I rejected it. Regardless of who I am, the fact remains that your actions hurt me. The divorce compensation is money to make amends for that pain. Since you can only express your apology through an amount, I expect you to pay a sum befitting of that. It has nothing to do with my income. When I told him it would go from mediation to trial if he refused any further, he obediently paid up. It seems he borrowed the compensation for both of them from his company. 
Although he was able to take out a loan from the company, he apparently thought he could quietly continue working at headquarters and pay it back. However, the company found out about what he had done from somewhere. On top of that, they discovered his request for a solo assignment was for that purpose. If you commit misdeeds, you can't escape divine retribution. They say God is watching for good reason. The higher-ups at the company were furious that the solo assignment had been used for such an immoral purpose. As a result, he was demoted and sent to a rural subsidiary. His salary went down too, and I hear the couple is now desperately working to pay off the debt. But in the end, that might be for the best. In a new place, Zachary can start from scratch as a normal family without people knowing he was born to such parents. An innocent child won't have to be sacrificed for the actions of the parents. As for me, after the divorce, my work was made into a movie as planned and caused quite a boom. Merchandise was launched, and in this day and age where ebooks are becoming mainstream, the physical books sold with bonus goods were a huge hit. My editor keeps pressuring me about my next work. My busy life continues, leaving me no time to dwell on past heartaches. My works are being broadcast here and there, with a big response from overseas as well. Despite everything that happened, Noah grew up to be an upstanding young man. He's advancing to university this spring, but he told me he wants to use these four years to find what he truly wants to do, what he's good at, just like I did. No matter what happens, it's my life, so I won't rely on you, mom. He says such cheeky things, but as a parent, I'd be happier if he relied on me a little. For now, maybe I'll try writing a new story with a cheeky university student as the protagonist. I have a feeling my next work will be a hit too. I selfishly think such thoughts as I watch over my reliable son.